This is Digital Pathology Today. Now here's your host, Dr. Joseph Anderson. Amidst this digital transformation in pathology, the talk seems to be largely centered around whole slide imaging of h and &E stained tissue sections. But what about cytology? Why don't we hear much talk about digital cytology and what are some of the unique challenges in cytology in terms of going digital? Welcome to Digital Pathology Today. I'm Joe Anderson. Our guest is Michael Quick, Vice President of Research and Development and Innovation at Hologic. We're going to be talking about the history and evolution of cervical cancer screening, all the way from pap smears to thin prep to incorporating digital pathology and image analysis in the process. Will we finally be able to say goodbye to the light microscope? And what are some of the parallels and lessons learned comparing cervical cancer screening by cytology in pathology to breast cancer screening by digital mammography in radiology. Mike Quick from Hologic, welcome to the podcast. Thanks for having me, Joe. Yeah, we hear a lot about uh, digital pathology, or I should say histology, right, where we're looking at whole tissue sections. Uh, but what about cytology, which is a big part of pathology? Uh, but we don't really hear about, you know, digitizing cytology preparations. Uh, why is that? It's a great question, Joe. And, and it's one that's really uh, kind of interesting because cytology is actually one of the most earliest areas where we saw the application of digital technology and as foundation. But there are really a lot of, of interesting challenges with cytology that are unique that are, don't carry over to pathology. So I'd like to share a little bit about that and some of the differences that you see with, with some of the challenges with cytology compared to, to pathology. Yeah, so cytology is a, a huge application in medicine and pathology. Um, probably, you know, so there's fine needle biopsies and other things. Probably the thing most people are familiar with is pap smears in women's health. You know, so what are the, the differences between the, you know, whole tissue sections in histology and cytology? So it really requires a unique application of technology to handle the two different sample types. Tissue sections, as you know, are very uniform in terms of the preparation. They're cut on a microtome, so we can set the thickness and, and know the depth of that tissue when it's created. There's all different kinds of unique challenges around pathology too, but it's very different from cytology where you're really looking at whole cells and individual cells and groups and clusters. And while a lot of advances have been made to make the samples as thin and uniform as possible, because the whole, whole cells are mounted onto the slide, there's a lot of variation in the depth, which requires a whole different approach in terms of focus and getting good quality images when you move to a digital environment. One of the huge advances, I mean, not in terms of going digital, but just in women's health screening and pap smears was the advent of the thin prep. We could maybe take a step back and talk about the differences between the traditional smear the cells would be exfoliated using a brush and applied to this, the, the slide and then stained with the Pap Papanicolaou stain. You know, like you said, it was it created various depths of focus, maybe cumbersome, and the, the, the cells weren't spread evenly along the slide. But somewhere in the early 2000s, you know, we came up with new ways of doing things where the cells were maybe suspended in a liquid and the thin prep you know, allowed us to spread the cells more evenly and maybe in a, a more uniform depth of focus, not the least of which made it a lot easier for the pathologist to review the case, but then also probably made it so the pathologist or cytotechnologist did not miss anything and made it easier to identify the lesions we're looking at. So maybe talk about the advent of that technology and how that relates to going digital. Yeah, it's a really interesting story. And you know, if we go to to the way, way back machine. You know, cytology was used primarily for uh, cervical cancer screening, had been the most successful screening tool used uh, worldwide, although primarily in developing parts of the world. And we had seen a significant decrease in cervical cancer with the introduction of the pap smear. But that technology remained basically unchanged for almost 50 years. And as we were looking at opportunities to move to a digital environment, say, are there ways to increase the accuracy of cervical cancer screening and improve on the pap smear? We started looking at digital technologies and found that the quality of the sample was really the first thing that needed to be addressed. And being able to get over the hurdle of those thick and thin areas, obscuring blood and inflammation and things that make it very difficult to identify those rare abnormal cells on a cervical slide when it's prepared with conventional methods. You know, we talked about the differences between cytology and histology preparations. 
you so you just said it's a cervical cancer screening and we're looking at various degrees of atypia or dysplasia actually the fact that we're looking to solve a specific problem like it's a pretty narrow problem might actually lend itself to being amenable to this type of approach when we're applying image analysis and artificial intelligence. Cause maybe, so maybe tell us what exactly we're looking for. We're looking at nuclear features. We're looking at the nuclear cytoplasmic ratio, degree of atypia. So I would imagine that involves things like measuring the size and shape of the nucleus, the nuclear contours and so forth. So, you know, what are we looking for and how does that lend itself to uh, image analysis and approach or maybe even allow us to utilize artificial intelligence? I mean, it's, it's really interesting, I think, because it's, it really is a built for purpose type of application. Like you said, it's, it's very specific. There's a known problem to be solved. A typical cytotechnologist or pathologist would be looking through 70 or 80,000 cells on a microscope slide looking for rare abnormalities that would be indicative of either cervical cancer or more importantly, the precursor lesions that help you identify that patient before she develops cervical cancer, where it's very treatable and virtually 100% curable at that stage. So we do, we've been able to apply artificial intelligence algorithms, um, and this goes back all the way to the early 2000s with the application for cervical cancer screening to do morphologic analysis. And it's exactly those things that you were talking about. We look at things like the, the nuclear density, the darkness of the nucleus related to the DNA content of that, things like the size of the nucleus in comparison to the cytoplasm. There's very definable nuclear features that are um, able to be measured and then through that that process being able to really bring those few abnormal cells that may be present on the slide to the forefront for the cytotechnologist or pathologist to make a more accurate or efficient diagnosis. I kind of call that the needle in the haystack problem. It's very tedious or it can be tedious and time consuming and then I think there's also issues around and because of that you know fatigue there's regulations around this area of pathology or cytology, probably many more so than, than other areas. You know, I think it's kind of a unique area because here we have, this is a screening test, right? It's not a, it's not a diagnostic test. And as such, it's going to be high volume. All women get this test. It's unique in that the pathologist is reviewing only selected cases. I believe it's 10% and or all abnormal results. And then there's also guidelines about how many cases a cytotechnologist can review because of issues like fatigue and so on. And so maybe tell us a little bit about, you know, what Hologic has developed. What is the tool? Uh, how is it used? How, how widespread is it? What considerations uh, do labs need to take to, to implement uh, your solution? The things that you're, you're talking about are, are, are I think, fascinating. Um, but when you think about cervical cancer screening, it's one of the most highly regulated areas of diagnostic medicine today. There are very tight controls around quality control processes and the way that we monitor the number of slides that can be read by a cytotechnologist in a given day, even to the pathologist level if they're doing primary screening. So it is incredibly regulated, but working in that environment, does not preclude us from continuing to make advances. And, and that's what we've continued to do at Hologic, beginning with the, the introduction of the thin prep pap test back in 1996, and then the advancement to really where we started from, which was image analysis on those samples. And that goes back to an FDA approval in 2003 for the thin prep imaging system. And that was the first entry point for a primary diagnosis within anything related to pathology um, that allowed the analysis of a sample to be able to identify areas of greatest significance to present that to a cytotechnologist and eventually to a pathologist um, in order to make that diagnosis. So that's really kind of been the history of where we've come from. The latest advancements have been as we've really wanted to move towards an entirely digital transformation where it's not just the image analysis, we're capturing the images and doing the image analysis, but then driving the user back to the microscope. We're actually completing the circle and being able to uh, facilitate that review in a digital environment so the cytotechnologists and pathologists can make their entire interpretation um, on a you know high resolution high definition screen and enable all the things that come along with with that digital transformation so we're going to be finally able to say goodbye to the microscope the light microscope and view things solely on the monitor 
I, I think that's definitely the direction where things are heading. I'm a cytotechnologist myself, and and you know I've always loved the microscope, and I think many of your listeners uh, feel the same. But at the same time, we're seeing that there are things that are available with the new tools that we just can't do with the conventional light microscope, and it's going to continue to drive us towards this digital transformation that we're seeing happening in pathology today. You're involved in other projects. Hologic is also. What have you learned from other projects like digital mammography and other screening modalities in, in women's health? And, and how do they apply or lessons learned that we can translate to cytology and digital pathology? We're really in a unique position to, um, to you know, have such a significant role in both cervical cancer and breast cancer screening for women really around the world. Uh, we've been technology leaders in that space and have continued to drive the adoption. I've seen that, that space evolve over the past couple of decades. One of my good friends is actually a radiologist and it's fun when we get together, we're able to kind of compare notes between the similarities and the differences between mammography and cytology for cervical cancer screening. You know, both are, are high volume tests that are done in a screening paradigm with women on a routine basis looking for the identification of early detection of disease leads for better outcomes. And so it's really neat to be on the forefront of developing those technologies that continue to make that process better. It's fascinating, the parallels there, and also the parallels between the image-based specialties of pathology and radiology. Both have had their digital transformations. You know, our listeners out there certainly have their opinions about the similarities and differences and whether or not we're going to see convergences between the two. But I think at the very core of it, you know, we're looking at images, whether it's x-ray or a CT or an MRI versus you know, now in pathology, it's becoming very clear that abundantly clear that once we digitize it, it's an image, you know, it's now a file as data, and we can analyze it, parse it, look at it, you know, apply tools such as artificial intelligence to it. So tell us about AI. Uh, How are you incorporating artificial intelligence to solve the problems in cervical cancer? Sure, absolutely. Like I said, you know, back in 2003, we had our first entrance into image analysis, which was using what we call traditional machine learning, um, doing feature analysis, looking at things that are able to be measured um, in the context of how we identify abnormalities um, within cells. That technology has certainly evolved over the past 15 plus years. And with our latest development, we're able to incorporate those cutting edge technologies, not just traditional machine learning, but also moving into deep learning and convolutional neural networks networks. We're using large volumes of data and are able to train our algorithms in order to be even better in detecting rare abnormalities on those slides. Um, That obviously needs to come to bear in clinical practice, um, but we're very excited about the advancement of the technology. So I'd imagine, you know, with this deep learning technologies, we're doing more than just being able to get better at identifying high-grade dysplasia, for example. You know, what is this going to mean for the care of the patient. Absolutely. So it's translating into two things. One, the, the accuracy, um, as well as the efficiency in, in terms of the application of the technology. So on the accuracy side, the bar for previous image analysis algorithms was to help a reviewer, whether that be a cytotechnologist or a pathologist, to make the decision as to, can they sign that case out as negative based on the information that's provided? Or the inflection point is, do I need to look at the entire slide in order to make an accurate diagnosis? That was the bar that was set for the previous um, system that, that's you know, widely used across um, the US and many parts of the world today. When we move into the new algorithm, it's a higher bar because we're able to select enough diagnostic material from those 70 or 80,000 cells so that the user can actually make a diagnosis just from the information that's provided in a gallery of images on a single slide. Um, they still have the whole slide image available so that they can you know, have supportive context to ensure they make the correct diagnosis, uh, but it really gives them the tools for a higher bar to make a, an accurate diagnosis more efficiently. Hologic is developing partnerships with exciting companies such as Google and other things. How does this work? How is teaming up with Google and other companies in in the tech space going to help advance what you do? Hologic's really been on the forefront in in the leadership role in all things related to women's health and particularly in diagnostics. And so as we look for technology partners, we wanted to partner up with the same. Um, And and certainly when you look at companies like Google and what they're well known for in terms of leadership in the technology space, application of artificial intelligence, and also with cloud and being able to manage cloud infrastructure, cloud support, the tools that are necessary for 
remote diagnostics. So it was really a great partnership that, that we're collaborating on, you know, a couple of different areas. One is advancement of AI and machine learning tools. Google has some fantastic um, tools in their toolbox, so to speak, that we're making well, you know, good use of um, as we develop, continue to develop, you know, more algorithms for today and for the future. Um, so utilizing the, you know, the latest cutting edge tools that are part of Google's arsenal. And the other piece is about leveraging their cloud infrastructure. And so today we're generating massive amounts of data that we're using to build and train and validate algorithms. And with the power of Google Cloud, we're able to store and access that data, whether we're in my laboratory in Massachusetts, um, whether it is where I live in Phoenix, Arizona, um, or literally with collaborators around the world. And so it's really exciting to be able to use that platform to access the data and then in, in future cases being able to access the data for remote diagnostics and being able to get the expertise um, that's required to make those accurate diagnoses to the locations that need it the most. Remote diagnosis has become maybe a very hot topic in light of the uh, COVID-19 health emergency where we have pathologists and other professionals signing out cases at home, doing things remotely. Um, so that's certainly a big area. And then you said applying this computing power is going to be an increasing need in the future. Now, I just heard this term digital assays in, in the last week or so, which I, I mean, I, intuitively, I know what it is. I mean, I've been, this has been in the back of my mind in, for some time now, but people are now articulating the term digital assay because assay, you think of a, a fancy molecular test or IHC or some kind of test that is external to digital pathology. But there's so much rich information just in the histology or the cytology. You know, so maybe you could tell us, what do we mean when we talk about a digital assay? It's something we started using internally, and, and we're seeing, like you said, more and more adoption of it, I think, in the field. Uh, you know, obviously, Hologic um, has a leadership role historically with cytology and mammography, but also over the past decade have really become leaders, and particularly in the context of COVID, with our molecular platform and the Panther and Panther Fusion and the assays that run on that. And everyone's familiar with the, this concept of having a platform and then assays that run on that platform, which are really just additional tools to provide diagnostic insight on a given patient. We lead the, the market in areas like uh, sexually transmitted infections, testing for chlamydia and gonorrhea, HPV, and viral load testing. We're, you know, we're you know, continuing to develop assays for HIV, HBV, HCV. This idea of having a, a menu of assays that run on a platform is very common in the way, the, kind of the thought model that we see in molecular diagnostics. And the same can be true about what we're seeing, I think, in digital pathology and digital cytology is that what we're seeing different companies do is continue to build platforms. And the first basis of that introduction of that platform is to create a digital image. You need to have a high quality image that's highly reproducible, that's regulated in order to be able to do anything downstream. And that's what we're seeing, you know, the advancement of the, in the field over the past couple of years. The FDA approval of the Philips system and the Leica system, you know, and and others in that process. It's, it's really about generating that platform. But then the question becomes: Well, now we've got these great images. What can we do with them? And that's where the idea of digital assays comes in. About can we generate these? digital tools or algorithms that are now being known as digital assays that can provide diagnostic insight that run on that platform. And you start to build out a menu of different digital assays that can run on those platforms. Um, and it's really exciting um, when you see how things have evolved in molecular diagnostics and see what that future runway is for digital pathology and digital cytology. It does create a very exciting future. But tell us about the, the roadmap of how we can develop these things and particularly articulate a value proposition, you know, create tools that are not only going to benefit patients, but also allow us to capture value. These have to be done, developed in a very rigorous way. They have to be validated according to, you know, best practices. But then also, you know, I think there's the temptation to say, well, you know, you have all this data and it's free. And, you know, so, A, how do you implement it in clinical practice? And how do you recoup the value of developing 
such a tool? You know, how do you deploy it, and how do you how do you bill for it? You know, what are the considerations in developing such a such tools? This, I think, is is really a key part of the conversation, and I think you're going to see all different kinds of models. We already are in terms of how this is going to happen. I think that you're going to see some companies that are going to step into this place that are creating the platforms that will also create the digital assays. Um, Hologic is doing that today with the development of the Genius Digital Diagnostics platform and our cervical cancer digital assay. Um, so that's kind of our first entry point with, with combining a platform together with the digital assay. We also see a lot of other companies that are AI companies in digital pathology that are just focused on the, the digital assay. They say you can use whatever platform you want or they're going to, to specify a given platform and they'll develop that content or build that menu, but we'll have to do that validation on a given platform in order to go th get through the regulatory hurdles. And then lastly, I think you're gonna see an, a, a space where individual researchers or institutions, academic research centers will want to develop their own content, um, you know, to develop their own digital assays. They have access to data, they have the tools and you know, some of the capabilities in order to be able to, to do that themselves. And so I think those three models are what you're gonna see you know, as this roadmap builds out for digital assays. One of the promises of digital pathology, or at least we like to imagine a future where everyone gets the same standard of care and that technology and expertise are democratized and available to everyone, then maybe the, the dark side could be where everyone has access to these tools and everyone wants to develop their own tools in their own labs, right? It's kind of like going back in time where we've seen these challenges in pathology, kind of a lack of standardization, particularly with respect to immunohistochemical markers. You know, I kind of call it the chocolate chip cookie problem in pathology, right? Where everyone wants to come up with their own batch of chocolate chip cookies and mine might be slightly different than yours. I might have a pinch of salt and macadamia nuts in there and, and you have your own recipe. So how, you know, how do we go about, you know, standardizing things, you know, rather than having everyone come up with their own tools in their own labs, how do we come up with solutions that are going to be uniformly agreed on and available to everyone? And that's where I, th I really think the field is going to move to is that, and we see this already today, the role that the regulatory bodies play is really critical in this Space. This is, is very new. There's a lot of outstanding questions about this. And so the, you know, different companies or institutions, the developers of the platforms are going to develop these digital assays. But at the end of the day, they need to pass through you know, what's going to be the rigorous bar to get through the regulatory approval to be able to demonstrate clinical utility. And I think that's going to be important, not just for the regulatory side of things, but also when we start talking about how are our laboratories going to get paid for this. You need to be able to demonstrate not just that there's clinical utility, but that it makes sense financially. You know, there's a whole process of establishing CPT codes so that laboratories can bill for it, so the pathologists can get paid for it. Yeah, you know, it's going to be a lengthy process to get through, but I think that having a standardized approach and being on a, a common platform um, and working through the regulatory bodies will help standardize that um, in the short to midterm. Yeah, I think a standardized approach will go a long way. Well, Mike Quick from Hologic, you're also a board member for the Digital Pathology Association. So maybe tell us a little bit about the work you're doing there, what your experience with the DPA has been, and how the DPA is helping advance clinical practice of pathology. Yeah, it's, it's one of the things I've really gotten excited about being a part of over the past several years. As we started embarking upon this journey of the digital transformation in cytology, I recognized that there was a voice that was missing in the greater digital pathology community. And so really got connected with the, the DPA through that so that we could start bringing awareness around the application for digital cytology to, to the field. And in that context, you'll learn more and more and got really excited about the work that they were doing. And so started serving on the board of directors, then headed up the membership committee for the past couple of years. Um, and now I'm on the executive board. It's, it's really a unique group of professionals. Uh, we've got folks from industry, from academia, from you know everything from well-established companies to startups, people who've been in the field forever, down to students and residents. So it really is a, a great sampling of uh, folks that are excited about digital pathology. It's a nonprofit. Their main goal is to really move the field forward towards the adoption of the technology so that it can have the impact um, on changing patients' lives around the world. It's a unique time to be in pathology, and I think DPA serves a unique niche. You know, we all kind of have this sense of inevitability that, you know, digital is the way forward. 
and that you know someday we won't even need to use the word digital pathology, right? Digi digital pathology will be pathology, right? <laughs> so is that is that kind of the view that uh, the DPA takes? Absolutely. I mean, just like it is in radiology, nobody says digital radiology, and yet the vast majority of all films, you know, I even use the word films, but I mean, it's read on a screen today. You know, it's hard to find any place where they're developing film or a light box, a hospital related to radiology. And that's very likely going to be the, the case. You know, we've, we've had some fits and, and starts, I think, in terms of the hype around digital pathology and that transformation. We've never seen the advancement like we have over the past several years, first starting with regulatory approvals and moving with the quote unquote killer apps, unique applications that just can't be done with traditional pathology in, in moving the field forward. I think we are at, at certainly at an inflection point. Things are accelerating ever more quickly. So tell us about yourself and how did you first get interested in digital pathology? I'm a cytotechnologist by background. Um, I trained at the University of Vermont back in the 90s. And as I was reading conventional pap smears through a microscope and, and learning to see what that was all about, the, the, there was a, a nagging part of me that just said, there has to be a better way to do this. You know, back in those days, we were looking at somewhere between 100 and 300,000 cells on a slide, you know, obscured by blood and mucus and debris. And, you know, looking for that, as you said, the proverbial needle in a haystack. You know, even back then, I remember talking with one of my classmates about, you know, wouldn't it be great if we could just look at these these cells on a computer screen or a large screen in front of us um, and, and have a, a computer identify those areas and then we become more the diagnosticians. We're the ones who are making the decision, but we're not doing the hunting looking for those rare abnormal cells. I mean, that goes back 25 years. And I didn't know that it was going to take this long to get there. <laughs> but the challenge was the technology didn't exist. I mean, if you think back to 25 years, what our computers were like, what cameras were like in terms of digital cameras and how much that technology has evolved you know, over the past 20 to 25 years, we're in a very different place. And so, you know, it's, it's been neat to have that vision, but now to have it come through, you know, to completion. And, you know, I've had a lot of different roles um, all, all around women's health and cervical cancer screening. And it was really in the work that I was doing internationally. I had responsibilities in our emerging markets. And it was the insight there that the tools that we had that had allowed um, us to be so successful with reducing deaths to cervical cancer in the U.S. and Western Europe were not necessarily the same tools that we were going to need to be successful and have that same impact in other parts of the world. And it was in that context that I started leading the R&D group at Hologic to develop this technology um, and say that, you know, are there a set of, of things that we could do that could change this so that we can bring cutting edge technology with better diagnoses, more efficient and accurately um, to all parts of the world. Um, and that's what led to the, the development of the Genius Digital Diagnostic System that we have now. Mike Quick from Hologic has been our guest. So tell us before we wrap up, what excites you? Uh, where do you see the field headed in the next 10 years or so? I couldn't be more excited about the future. Um, one has been the, the exposure to so many amazing professionals in this field that are really driving things forward. It's a few um, you know, people that have that kind of vision that can really uh, change the entire practice of medicine in a field like pathology. It's really one of the last areas that hasn't gone through this digital transformation. And when you see the application of new technologies, artificial intelligence, the combination of companies not working just against each other, but working with one another together with academic researchers to advance the field, all for the betterment you know, of health, not just of women, but really of patients around the world. It's super exciting. Advancing the field for patients around the world. It is exciting. Well, our guest has been Mike Quick from Hologic. We'll see you next time on Digital Pathology Today. This has been Digital Pathology Today. Please be sure to subscribe. Thanks for listening.